Are you able to see the full screen now? Yes, yes. Okay. So, um, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Shalini. I'm working as a PICU consultant in uh, Princess Estra Hospital, uh, which is a part of Deccan College of Medical Sciences from Hyderabad. And um, we'll go through a quick approach to arrhythmias in children. So um, let us quickly interpret this um, uh, ECG. So what, what does everyone think of? Um, it, it looks quite uh, irregular, isn't it? Um, with varying um, RR intervals and it, it looks a bit chaotic. It looks quite irregular. But then um, the basic principles of reading an ECG, uh, we will have to use that. So look at the P wave, look at the PR interval, QRS morphology, um, the ST, the T wave, etc. And then um, if we analyze it in a step-by-step -step pattern, um, I think things should be easy for us. So here, if we see, this is a P wave followed by a QRS and, an S and the T wave. So again, same P, QRS, and T. And here again, but of course, the RR interval is a bit uh, longer uh, here. And then again, here it occurs, uh, the RR interval again occurs um, is, is, is shorter than compared to the previous one. So it's a varying RR interval. Otherwise, the morphology of the various waves, everything is fine. So this is an example of sinus arrhythmia. So this is not a true arrhythmia. This is this variation is seen because of the variation in the respiration, like inspiration and expiration. So this is not a true arrhythmia. It is a sinus arrhythmia, which is quite normal. Okay. So um, yeah. So let us have uh, let, let us quickly uh, have an overview of uh, the arrhythmia, like a bird's eye view. So arrhythmias can be classified as those are too fast or those that are too slow. So those too fast are tachyarrhythmias. In that, you can further classify them as narrow complex or broad complex tachyarrhythmias, depending upon the duration of your QRS interval. Okay. Um, and this can also be subclassified further as supraventricular or ventricular uh, arrhythmias, depending upon the origin of the um, arrhythmia. Okay? So um, if it's above the level of ventricles or at the level of ventricles. So coming to slow, to slow or bradyarrhythmias, arrhythmias, um, we have, um, they can be because of sinus node dysfunction or a problem in the AV node, atrioventricular node disease. Okay, so these the arrhythmias are basically so this classification is based on pulse. So you look for pulse and see whether it's too fast or too slow. Is there a third category? What if the pulse is not there? So that is uh, then uh, there are again some four classes when you don't have a pulse, but then you see some kind of a rhythm. Asystole, PEA, which is otherwise known as pulseless electrical activity. And then we have ventricular fibrillation or a pulseless VT, a pulseless ventricular tachycardia, which is without a pulse. Um, going on next. So now let us look at the uh, two fast rhythms of tachyarrhythmias. Um, there, there are a couple of them. Um, so let us look at them one by one in detail. Um, yeah. <coughs> So this is um, coming to um, supraventricular tachycardia. As the name itself suggests, the origin of the tachycardia is somewhere above the level of ventricle, which means the level is either at the atrial level or at the junction or at the atrioventricular nodal level, AV, AV node level, okay, rather than the ventricle, that's above the ventricle. So there are various uh, tachyarrhythmias which are from comprises within this SVT or supraventricular tachycardia. Yeah. Uh, sinus tachy is a subgroup of SVT actually. So we have sinus tachy, atrial flutter, AVNRT, which is nothing but atrioventricular, nodal reentrant tachycardia, junctional tachycardia, AVRT, uh, ectopic atrial tachycardia, multifocal atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, etc. So you can see that all of these are arising either at the atrial level or at the junctional level. 
So we look at these one by one in detail. So uh, broadly classifying supraventricular tachycardia can be classified as regular and irregular. Okay. So regular ones are sinus tachycardia. This is in brackets because yeah, it's um yeah, it's not as ominous um sometimes, but sinus tachycardia, AVRT, AVNRT, atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, and junctional ectopic tachycardia. The irregular ones are again flutter, so flutter can come both, it can be regular or irregular. Then we have atrial fibrillation, and then we have multifocal atrial tachycardia, which can be irregular. A SVT can also be classified in a different way. So as automatic and re-entrenched, it is based upon mechanisms of the origin of um, SVT. So the first one was an anatomic uh, classification of supraventricular versus ventricular arrhythmia, and then in SVT we have regular, irregular, and then we have automatic and re-entrenched. So what's meant by automatic tachycardia? Uh, so these are generally dependent on adrenaline or catecholamine. So um, higher the adrenaline. Um, so uh, these are usually dependent on that. And then we have this warm up phase and a cool down phase. Okay. So um, sorry, is that is that me? Oh, yeah. So in automatic, we have sinus tachycardia ectopic atrial tachycardia and multifocal atrial tachycardia. And then we have something called as re-entrenched where there is a re-entrenched circuit is being formed. And then because of the circuit and then it starts triggering um, um, the uh, starts triggering the impulses. So the best examples would be atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. These two are occurring at the atrial level. And then now if we come down a bit, to the nodal level, the AVN level, then we have AVRT, which is atrioventricular reentrant, then we have ADNRT, which is atrioventricular nodal reentrant, and then we have um, junctional, uh, paroxysmal junctional reentrant tachycardia. Okay. Um, I hope I'm um, unclear if, if there's any question. Um, yeah, there's no question till now, but yeah. uh, trust me, you're very much clear. It is really sure. good. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you, Nitin. Um, so now we have, yeah, now let us look at some of the ECGs and try to understand it. So uh, um, this, this is an ECG of what you have. So again, we'll start our analysis. Um, we have, we just have to look at three things, P wave, QRS, uh, and then uh, whether in QRS it's narrow complex or broad complex. In P wave, if your P wave morphology is fine or if it's not fine, and then if it is regular or irregular. Um, these are the two things which you need to know, which you need to analyze. So here in the in lead one, we have P wave here uh, and P wave followed by QRS. QRS is a narrow complex, isn't it? Everyone agrees with it. We define narrow complex as something as a QRS interval less than 0 0.09 seconds. So just by the looks of it, you can say that it's narrow complex. And we have, and it's tachycardia, of course. Um, I hope you all know how to, just a quick recap as to how to calculate the heart rate. It's, um, you look at the RR interval and then you divide 1500 divided by the number of small boxes or 300 divided by the number of large boxes. This is one large box. And then in one large box, we have five small boxes. So in that case, it would be here, uh, it would be somewhere five plus, one or two seven, so fifteen hundred by seven. That is tachycardia. Um, so we have normal P waves uh, here as well. We have P waves here. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so what is this? So we have normal P waves. We have normal QRS complexes, and then there is tachycardia. So it's the sinus tachycardia. I mean, this you know, it's as simple as sinus tachycardia. Um, and the what happens here is the normally your pacemaker is the sinus node, isn't it? We have multiple pacemakers in the heart. First is the sinus node, and uh, if the sinus node is not functional, then the next person takes over. The next level takes over, which is your atrioventricular uh, node. And then if that is also failing, then we have the his working, and then the last is your ventricular. Sinus node is the boss because it's the 
it's beating at the maximum rate i mean it's be, it's firing at a faster pace than compared to the other pacemakers of the heart every tissue of the heart is specialized to myocardium you know it can it can generate its own impulses but um, sinus node is the boss if you want to think of it in a typical way so here the sinus node is triggering at a faster rate than what it's normally supposed to do for the age for example in an adult more than 100 is tacky so instead of firing somewhere at 80 to 100 or somewhere at 80 it's just firing at 130 for whatsoever reason okay so uh, the common causes are fever exertion anxiety fear factor hypovolemia you know and some of the other pathological ones again hypovolemia very very thyrotoxicosis you know, these are all the causes. <laughs> Let us analyze this rhythm now. Um, so, um, can you actually analyze P wave to RS and then the regularity? So, it's again regular. It's a narrow complex because the QRS is narrow complex, as you can see. So, it's narrow complex tachycardia. Most often, the narrow complex tachycardias are supraventricular, and most often, the wide complex tachycardias are ventricular. Of course, there are a few examples. <coughs> so, um, we have, um, <coughs> sorry, so um, we can't really see a P wave here, isn't it? Can you? We really can't see a P wave. It's not very clear. Um, can't can't really see. But then there is narrow complex. So this is what we call as SVT. So I I, I mentioned I know that I mentioned earlier that SVT comprises of large group of tachycardias. But to make um, a life simple, um, SVT by and large is most commonly um, uh, the AVRT and the AVNRT are like are more, more commonly known as, you know, supraventricular tachycardia, the classical supraventricular tachycardia. So here, there is, and then the important differences between sinus tachycardia and the SVT. So by SVT here, I mean AVRT or AVNRT. So the differences are, uh, it's important. So in ST, in sinus tachycardia, you can see a P wave, but in SVT, you can't really see a P wave. We'll come to the details of P wave later. You can't really see a P wave before every QRS complex. All you can see is a narrow QRS complex and then uh, absent P waves. And then here again, the beat to beat variability is not there. In sinus tachycardia, we talked about sinus arrhythmia earlier, isn't it? So there is normally a, a, a difference between your inspiration and your expiration, the RR variability. In sinus tachycardia, that is preserved. But in SVT, you actually lose the uh, beat to beat or the RR interval is quite fixed. It's not as variable, okay? Uh, and then the other differences between uh, sinus tachy and SVT would be, um, uh, SVT is usually an abrupt onset and then it, it, it's abrupt. It starts off suddenly and then it ends suddenly. But in sinus tachycardia, um, it usually, you remember, it, come, it, it comes under the automatic pathway. So automatic is adrenergic dependent. And then it has a warm up and a cool down phase. But then SVT is actually coming under this pathway. Then it is the re-entrant pathway where it, um, it starts off suddenly and then there is an abrupt termination as well. So sinus tachy, there is a warm up and a cool down. Like, I mean, it's gradual onset and offset, but SVT starts off and stops suddenly. So these are some of the differences you would have to remember. The most important thing is you will not see any waves here. Okay. Uh, Sorry, there is a question and yeah. uh, the, Dr. Shailender wants to ask how do we differentiate between P wave and T wave in uh, uh, SVTs? Yeah. Um, P wave and T wave. How to differentiate yeah. between them? Yeah. So, uh, it, it, uh, so normally uh, P wave is preceding your QRS complex, but then it always doesn't have to be because you will see that in AVRT, AVNRT, sometimes the P waves can occur retrograde as well. It can come after QRS complex as well, and then sometimes it's difficult to uh, it's difficult to see. A, a very classic P wave, if you're, I mean, it, it's usually upright in your inferior lead, like we lead two, three, and AVF, and then it is usually inverted in uh, lead AVR. And then it's usually preceding your Q, uh, it's usually preceding your QRS complex. Okay, so this is the no normal classification. This is how your normally your P wave is supposed to be. But 
but sometimes if it is occurring after that then you might not be really able to differentiate between t wave and t wave t wave, t wave usually occurs after qrs complex but um, in some situations you might not be able to differentiate that is the case when you would know that something is not normal something is not right it's not a normal sinus rhythm and then you will have to dig into more detail okay if t wave is normal it's fine if it's abnormal then it's something wrong and then you have to look, look further sometimes it can be difficult does that does that answer the question yeah i think so but let's say there are a couple okay. of questions pouring in the chat room we'll take one sure. by one sure so um, just continuing with my talk so svt we said classical is avrt and avnrt so again your av nodal reentrant tachycardia is more common common than your avrt in children but then um, we'll uh, we'll come to that i'll first talk about avrt and then i'll talk about av nodal so um, i think i might just slow down a bit i mean this can so we will do with atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia what does it mean so normally if uh, it is your sa node here this is your av node okay this big circle this is your perkin uh, this is your bundle of hills and then here comes your division that is the perkin fibers okay so um normally the this is how the pathway is isn't it can everyone see my cursor actually moving are you able to yeah. see my cursor okay so here uh, in av avrt what happens there is a accessory pathway okay uh it it's somewhere you know somewhere located somewhere else and this is uh, this is like a hole so, so let's understand the normal conduction how, how it occurs so from the sa node uh, the impulses pass to the atrioventricular node now atrioventricular node is a very specialized tissue okay so it has a property of slowing or delaying the conduction okay when it arises from the sa node it doesn't quickly allows the impulse to just quickly pass through it actually slows and delays the conduction okay and then it slows and then it conducts to the ventricle that's very important so here in accessory pathway that property is missing so accessory pathway whatever comes through it just quickly passes on it's like a hole it just allows any impulse to quickly pass through without causing a delay in the conduction okay now this difference is important so what happens in avrt there is a uh, accessory pathway here and the impulses instead of going through the avrt i mean sorry in, instead of going through the normal pathway is somehow you know anter and like a anterograde or retrograde is traversing through the accessory pathway and this in turn incites it this in turn causes a reentrant circuit so we look, look into that but that, that's the difference okay in avrt you have a, a special you have an accessory pathway between the atria and the ventricles apart from your normal uh, pathway okay so um, look into more detail so this is uh, your av node normally what happens your impulse comes through here and then there is a bit of slowing to the av node and then it goes to the true ventricle what happens when there is a premature atrial complex so this complex instead of occurring at regular interval has occurred little earlier you know soon after an impulse atria is fired and soon after there is another complex which is fired which is fired so this premature atrial complex uh, it enters the uh, av node here as usual <coughs> and not the bypass tract it actually first enters the um, if, if it enters the av node and then it's conducted uh, the impulse is conducted through the av node very slowly and then it goes to the ventricle but then here what happens this premature atrial complex goes back um, goes back through the accessory pathway and remember that this does not have any slowing properties isn't it so it 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 if it passes through the accessory pathway very quickly and then within a just you know like the ventricles are just now activated and within a just the atria are activated again because of the retrograde impulse which is coming through the accessory pathway and then the atria are fired and in this goes back through the uh, av node again with a bit of delay goes to the ventricles and then in a gif it passes through the accessory pathway so kind of a reentrant circuit is created okay so that's what triggers so uh, when for example this wpw syndrome where there is accessory pathway accessory bundle of kent so this 
premature. Normally, what happens uh, is a normal sinus uh, uh, impulses. This traverses through both pathways and then it finds. But then whenever there is this pre-excitation, premature atrial complex uh, occurs, it, it causes a loop. It causes the re-entrant socket. So um, now there are again two types of that, orthodromic and antidromic. So uh, if you leave the right side of the bit first, first let's discuss this blue bit. So um, the atria no normally passing through the AV node and then bundle of the branch, and then it's going back through the accessory pathway, causing the firing of atria again, and then it is again coming back. So this is the circuit we just talked about. So let's look at what the ECG is gonna be like. So um, the P wave actually occurs just after the QRS complex. So because the ventricle has contracted and then it quickly passed, the impulse quickly passed through to the atria, and then the atrial contraction is occurring right after the ventricle contraction. So the P wave is occurring right after the QRS complex, and you are not able to always see this because the P wave is embedded in your QRS complex or in your TST. So P wave is embedded actually here. That's the reason you are not able to see a P wave, and that's why we call it a missing P wave or P wave absent. Okay, and then uh, the ventricles. So how are the ventricles contracting? The ventricle is excited through the normal pathway, isn't it? This is the normal pathway. So but this, this is the impulse course, and then through that, the ventricle is contracting. So your QRS morphology will be normal, which is a normal, uh, which is a narrow complex, or which is a normal. So what's happening here, the P wave is missing, the QRS complex is narrow, and then there is tachycardia. This is your classical SVT, what we talked about, okay? Uh, what happens in, um, what happens if this occurs in the other way around, okay? So if, for example, if this premature atrial complex, for example, has, uh, has first reached the accessory pathway, then it quickly goes through the accessory pathway. And then it goes retrograde via, it passes through the accessory pathway, and then it excites the ventricles, okay, directly. It's exciting the ventricles, causing the ventricular contraction, and then it goes back through the AV node, and then it is exciting the atria, okay? So here, what happens? Your P wave in this case will occur prior to the QRS complex because first your atria is contracting and then it's passing down very quickly through the accessory pathway and then causing the ventricle contraction, isn't it? So here you can see the P wave before QRS complex, okay? Uh, and But the QRS is wide because the ventricle contraction is occurring. Where's the impulse coming from to the ventricles? It's coming through the accessory pathway, which is not normal, isn't it? So that's why your QRS is wide. The morphology of the QRS is white. So uh, this is not the most common. So 90% of your SVT is this, okay, your narrow complex. But 10% of the cases, it can be wide complex tachycardia. Okay, So that's why we say uh, a ventricular tachycardia, what we actually classically see a VT can sometimes be an SVT. So 10% of your AVRTs are wide complex, QR, wide, wide complex tachycardia, but majority are narrow complex, okay. I hope uh, it's clear till now, no confusion. To repeat, supraventricular no tachycardias confusion. are normal. Very, QR very nicely been explained. Are normal, they're, they're usually narrow complex, but 10% of SVTs can be wide complex, and this is that exception. Okay, so now this is an example of uh, what is classically see a five month old with for feeding irritability, and then you see that this patient has a heart rate of 20, this is what, yeah, this is the child limit. Um, so, yeah, in neonates, more than 220, and then in uh, children, it's more than 180. Then we say it's SVT, isn't it? So, if you say it's classically 200 or 220, 240, um, and then this is what the ECG is like. Um, okay, so this, uh, this is your P wave here, and then what is unusual here is that you can see this slurred upstroke here. The QRS is, uh, the morphology of QRS complex is a bit different, isn't it? Here, so there is a slurring. It's not straight, there is a bit of slurring. So you can see below, um, this is called as delta wave. Okay, this occurs at the beginning of the QRS complex and this is known as delta wave. This is very classical of your pre-excitation syndrome, which is nothing but your Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, WP syndrome, where there is an accessory pathway of Kent. So, let us look at the ECG features of pre-excitation. So uh, 
So this ECG features of pre-excitation, remember you will not see when there is an episode of SVT happening, okay? When an SVT is happening, if it's because of AVRT, AVNRT, you really can't differentiate, okay? Uh, you can differentiate. So this features of pre-excitation are seen only when the patient is in normal sinus rhythm. Sometimes, more, most often, is seen only when the patient is in normal rhythm. So usually, what are the features of pre-excitation? The TR interval is short. Okay, here the TR interval is small, is shortened compared to the normal. Why does this happen? Uh, and then why is there this delta wave or this third upstroke? So where do I go back to? Uh, so uh, we we have seen uh, so, um, in WPW syndrome, what happens? Um, the impulse is conducted when the patient is in sinus rhythm and when there is an accessory pathway. The impulse is conducted via the normal pathway and via the accessory pathway also. Okay, um, And because the accessory pathway does not have the blocking property of AVN, isn't it? It conducts impulse very rapidly, direct. So this impulse is conducted directly down to the ventricle. And then the ventricular contraction has already begun. Okay, So that's why your PR interval is small. What is PR interval? It is the atrial contraction plus the conduction through the AV node, isn't it? So this bit is your contraction and this bit is the conduction through the AV node, isn't it? So here it's happening, but then this rapid conduction through the accessory pathway is happening quickly. So that's why this PR interval is shortened. And then your delta wave. Why does this delta wave happen? Because um, the ventricle is contracting through the impulses both from the normal pathway and also from the accessory pathway, okay? So from the accessory pathway, yeah, it's here. So from the accessory pathway also, uh, the ventricle is receiving uh, uh, the impulse and then it's directly uh, causing contraction of the ventricle. So that's why uh, your QRS complex is prolonged. But the rest of the QRS complex and the repolarization is normal because that happens in a normal way. Okay, um, so a, a, a few quick points regarding AVRT, atrioventricular, just for re-entrance, that's the pathway at once. So majority of the pathways will allow conduction in both directions. So it can be either anterograde or retrograde, okay? But majority, but only 15% of the cases, the conduction can be only retrograde and anterograde only conduction is very rare, okay? And, the free, and then it's important to know that the features of pre-excitation may be subtle or present only intermittently. You might not be able to always see this delta wave and also the patient may be having WPW, but you might not always appreciate this. You obtain an ECG, it can just look normal. You know? it's not, it may not be always present. And then the pre-excitation is more pronounced with increased vagal tone. So uh, whenever there is, so that's why in, in tachycardia, you might not appreciate the pre-excitation, but then when something has been used, like for example, adenosine has been used, sometimes adenosine is used to unmask, can unmask this uh, delta wave and then the shortened PR. So it can actually, if you use adenosine, it can actually show that this patient has a WPW syndrome, okay? So it's more pronounced when the heart rate is lower than when it is faster. And in retrograde only accessory conduction, uh, sometimes you might not be able to see any features of WPW because pre-excitation is not occurring, isn't it? Retrograde only means the part, the, the accessory bundle which is there is uh, causing only retrograde, like only uh, the impulse is moving from ventricle to atria, from down to up. It's not going from up to down, so you're not able to see the features of uh, pre-excitation there. And yeah, as I said, during tachyarrhythmias, it's usually lost. So we have, uh, let's, let's not go into too much of this. I mean, we are coming to this um, later, the management. Uh, but one important thing um, which everyone should remember is normally any SVT, we have to follow the path vehicle maneuvers, adenosine, and synchronized cardio version. Um, I think we are all familiar with it. But in a patient who is documented to have pre-excitation, in a patient who is known to have a WPW syndrome, using adenosine can be a bit tricky. Okay, we know that adenosine is the first line treatment for a stable SVT. We all know that. But in a patient with uh, a known uh, uh, WPW, uh, what is the risk? 
so we know um, I have a picture here or no. So we know that um, what does adenosine do? It slows down the pathway. It, it slows down the uh, conduction through the AV node, isn't it? it essentially, for increases the, it prolongs the conduction through the AV node, adenosine. It's an AV nodal blocking agent. So what happens if a patient has accessory pathway and the uh, accessory pathway, and then if you are using adenosine, normally uh, whatever impulses are whatever reentrant circuit is uh, is formed and then the impulses are coming down um, this av node is acting as a as a block you know it's not allowing all of the impulses to conduct down to the ventricle but if if you are blocking this and then when there is this accessory pathway there is a shifting of us the the, uh, the shifting of the pathway from av node to the uh, to be uh, accessory so all the impulses all the uh, impulses which are generating from the atria will traverse down the accessory pathway very quickly. So if the patient is in flutter or if the HCR are hyper excited, and then if you are using adenosine and blocking this, so the AV node is blocked, but then there's nothing to block the accessory pathway, isn't it? The accessory pathway is open. So all of the, all of the uh, impulses which is generating from the atria will quickly traverse through the accessory pathway Every, then there, there is a one is to one conduction, atria to ventricle, and it can turn, it can lead on to ventricle tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. So this is the danger of using uh, of using adenosine. I mean, there's nothing you can do to prevent it. I mean, if there is a patient with epilepsy, um, you and then if you need to use adenosine, um, then you, I mean, uh, you, I mean, you, you don't know if there's a patient you don't know that there is. Um, he has this WPW just come to you for the first time in SVT, and then you have used adenosine, and then if that is terminated into a ventricular fibrillation or a ventricular tachycardia, it's nothing that you have done wrong. This is important for us to remember and also for us to counsel the parents that there's nothing that you know the, which could have been prevented. I mean that, and then you should, the, all you need to do is you have to be equipped to, to tackle the ventricular fibrillation or the ventricular tachycardia when it occurs. And then you document it as WPW. Next time onwards, you would not be using it. But if first time if the patient has presented to you, there's nothing much you can really do about. Then that's that's the first bit of SVT. The coming to the atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia. I hope it's all okay so far. It's it's a bit. It's, it's a really bit. good so far. Okay. Um. Thanks. Um. So now coming on to atrioventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia. So. All this while, it was occurring at between the atria and the ventricle. This is the re-entry, but here now it's occurring at the nodal level, and that triggers the tachycardia. So now this uh, here, uh, we have. Let, let us know a bit in detail regarding the AV node itself. So AV node is very specialized again. So this is your uh, cartoon representation of your atrioventricular node. Okay. So normally we have again in the AV node, there is something called as fast pathway, there's something called as slow pathway. Okay. So sinus beat is arising. Normally what happens, the impulse traverses down both the fast and the slow pathway. The fast pathway has a longer refractory period and the slow pathway has a shorter refractory period. Okay. So the normally the impulse is traversing through both and then it's traversing to the Perkin G, I mean to the bundle of it and it's exciting the ventricle. And then the ventricular contraction occurs and then it, it goes back to the slow pathway. It meets the uh, impulse coming through and then it, it aborts or it terminates. Okay. This is what normally happens. What happens when there is an extra systole? I think all the trouble starts whenever there is an extra systole or a premature atrial complex. So whenever there is an extra systole, remember that I said that fast pathway has a longer refractory period. So when it arrives, so this is still in the refractory period, isn't it? This is a premature complex. Your fast pathway is still in the refractory period. So impulse can't really traverse here. So it, it starts traversing down the slow pathway. And then it conducts down to the ventricles and then there is a ventricle contraction. But then now um, it goes back through the fast pathway. I mean, obviously the, uh, and then by the time it's traversing through the fast pathway, now this fast pathway has recovered. It's no longer in the refractory period because a bit of time has lapsed, isn't it? So the slow path went then coming back. So this is no longer in the refractory period. And then it starts conducting impulse retrogradely through the fast pathway. And then 
here if you come to this diagram on the third to the fast pathway it excites the atria and then it travels us down the slow pathway so now a reentrant circuit is established at the atrioventricular node at the avn level and this causes firing of tachycardia the same representation here so again um there are atypical and very atypical but then the typical are 90% okay so here uh we have something called as um slow fast pathway is the first one um slow fast means the anterograde conduction is through the slow pathway retrograde through the fast pathway and this is the loop okay so this normally amounts to 90% of your cases again and here what happens your p wave is hidden in the qrs complex because what's happening here uh ventricle is contracting here and then soon after the ventricle contraction uh the impulse goes back through the fast pathway and then immediately excites the atria so your p wave occurs right after the qrs complex most often you can't see the p wave so it's as good as a narrow complex tachycardia with absent p wave the same uh, as what we saw earlier sometimes in lead 2 you can appreciate a pseudo s so sometimes in lead 1 you can appreciate a pseudo r i mean this is quite classic again but then you really have to look quite closely or keenly so for all practical purposes absent the, the all the svt features you know heart rate more than 220 more than 180 and then absent p waves narrow complex tachycardia loss of feed to beat variability and all so this is again very classic atypical is when there is fast slow path we will not bother about this that it happens in 10% of the cases and we and then here uh, it, it's again that counterpart you know the avnrt the, the right side counterpart so that happens only in 10% cases so um acute i think treatment is the same as what we all know um we'll come to the path we'll come to the algorithm later um uh, so what is what, what is this now um let us analyze it a bit by bit so here we have so again the principles of um ecg reading ecg p wave qrs complex and the algorithm uh regularity so here we have p wave a uh, very tiny bit of p wave small p wave here here also you can see a p wave isn't it in lead 2 in lead 3 there is a p wave but the p wave morphology is different isn't it the p wave morphology the p's are inverted in lead 2 and lead 3 and then what happens in avf it's inverted in avf and what happens in v1 it is upright in v1 and in v avr in in avr it is again maybe upright Isn't it normally it's supposed to be inverted, but then it's probably upright. You can see a little bit of um, positive deflection there, and then it is tachycardia if you count the um, heart rate. The QRS complex is normal. So as I said, narrow complex, narrow complex tachycardia is most often supraventricular. Okay, so but this is not sinus. This is something different. Can you all see? Yeah. so this is um, ectopic atrial tachycardia so uh, we have the p wave morphology is abnormal here that's all we have got that's all is the difference uh, from this one and the regular sinus isn't it what we saw so let us know a bit of what happens in ectopic atrial tachycardia so in this representation here this is your sinus node isn't it but here the sinus node is not the boss there's someone else who is trying to lead so there is some other force i in the atria which is acting as a boss and it is starting to give the impulses rather than your sinus node so this and uh, uh, this is so that's why the p wave morphology just the p wave morphology is different okay because the uh, force i is from somewhere else but not the sa node the mechanism is automaticity triggered and reentrant and the ecg p wave is abnormal uh, usually abnormal axis uh and then there should be at least three consecutive identical ectopic p waves uh but the qrs complex is normal because it's the impulse what whatsoever it's either from the it's a node or from ectopic but then it's traversing through the avn his perkin g so your qrs complex is entirely normal isn't it so that's the only difference between um, yeah that's that's the important point for ectopic so here if we look at this ecg there is i think inverted p waves here inverted p waves in lead 2 3 upright p waves in avr here uh here it's upright here it's upright here 
um, if you have inverted and in V1, it's upright again. Uh, it's inverted in V3, it's inverted in V4, V5, V6. This is not again quite. Uh, this is another example of uh, ectopic atrial tachycardia because the QRS rhythm is normal. It is a uh, narrow complex. There is tachycardia, but the P wave morphology is very abnormal, isn't it? So it is ectopic atrial tachycardia. Um, now, what is this? I think there is a bit of clue in here. This is the um, So if you look at the morphology of P waves here, uh, it's inverted and it says lead three, so it's inverted. But then here again, it's upright. Then here it's upright, but then the morphology of this is different from this, isn't it? So you can see at least different types of um, P waves here, but the QRS complex is like, it's, it's normal. QRS complex appears normal. Um, so yeah, you'll have to just, you'll have to go through every uh, thing. So again, this P is abnormal here, this P is abnormal, this is upright, it appears normal, this is abnormal. So, um, and again, if you go see the ECG below, so there are different morphologies of P wave, but the rest of the QRS complex, repolarization, everything is normal, isn't it? So this is known as multifocal atrial tachycardia. So the only difference between the previous one and now is there in ectopic atrial tachycardia, there is a single foci of ectopic, single foci, single ectopic uh, uh, atrial focus. But here, what happens? There is at least three. At least three of the ectopic atria, at, uh, atropic uh, atrial focus, which is acting as a pacemaker, and they are conducting the impulses. So that's important. And <coughs> the other thing is, there is uh, the rhythm is irregular, varying PP, varying PR and RR. For example, if the atria, this is your AV node. If the ectopic foci is just here, then your PR interval is narrow, isn't it? I mean, it's too slow. But then imagine if the foci is somewhere farther in the atria, then the PR interval will be different. And then again, um, the RR variability will be different. So this is an example of irregular rhythm. All this while we were looking at regular rhythm, this is an example of irregular. And at least three different P wave morphologies is the key point. <coughs> so now we're looking at this ECG. Um, Again, it's a tachycardia. The QRS complex is narrow, okay? And then where are the P waves? I think this was this question who one of the uh, uh, participants has asked as to how do we differentiate between P wave and T wave, isn't it? So this is one example where it, it can be a bit tricky. So here you can see some waves. Uh, this probably is a P wave because it's occurring you know, before the QRS complex, but then this morphology is also very similar, and this morphology is also very similar to P waves, isn't it? Three. So, three P waves. So, what is this? And then the pattern of P waves, it is sort of pattern, isn't it? And then there is no isoelectric baseline, it's just uh, going about. So, uh, this is an example of flutter. So, what happens in flutter? Flutter is an example of reentrant tachycardia. Your sinus node is not the boss here again. Some somewhere else, you know, the flutter waves are originating in the atria, and that again forms a part of reentrant circuit, and then it starts um, conducting impulses. Okay, so the mechanism is reentry within the right atrium. Okay, it's a narrow complex again because your uh, ventricle QRS is fine, isn't it? That's not affected. And then there is regular atrial activity of about 300 beats per minute. And then the flutter waves are classical sawtooth pattern. One thing you need to remember is where, where do you best appreciate this flutter wave? It is best seen in um, uh, lead to C and ABF. And there is loss of isoelectric baseline. And then here, one, there's something important to remember. Not all of the flutter waves are traversing and being conducted. We know that there is re-entry circuit and then a lot of flutter waves are coming. So a lot of P waves are being generated. But then we know that this AVN is a big gatekeeper. It doesn't allow all of the, all of the impulses to pass through. There is a there is slowing of impulses occurring at the a, a, AV node, isn't it? So not all the impulses are passed. Only, only few impulses are passed down the ventricle. 
so usually it happens in a block pattern sorry so usually it happens as a block or uh, as a uh, fixed av block or as a variable av block is 2 is to 1 3 is to 1 etc so here if we see uh, for example in the previous one itself you know let's go back to this so for every three p ways there is one qrs peak conducted isn't it so this is an example of 3 is to 1 block okay every third wave is only conducted down to the ventricle and then if we go here uh, this is a ventricle with this this is again variable av block where your ventricular rhythm is irregular okay that's why atrial flutter was there under your regular pathway and also regular rhythm regular arrhythmias and also in irregular arrhythmias if you remember the first couple of slides so variable av block causes your irregular pattern so uh, but on closer inspection you can actually see that there is a pattern of alternating 2 is to 1 and 3 is to 1 block okay so all so far so good three is to one we can appreciate very nicely the sort of pattern so what happens in a two is to one conduction so what happens here how does this look like to me i mean if i'm not going i mean if just this ecg is given to me i still go through the same thing p wave qrs etc and regular this is again regular rhythm okay i think everyone agrees with me there is narrow qrs complex just by visual like inspection you can say that it's a narrow rhythm so what is it by default it's a supraventricular tachycardia okay what kind of svt is it can you see the p wave um in lead one i really cannot see p wave lead two lead three i really can't see p wave i mean all i can see is the qrs complex followed by a t wave okay but then if you really if there is some cardiologist sitting and then if you really want to inspect on a closer look then maybe you know a little bit of appreciate here but then maybe a little bit of after the t wave there is a little bit of negative deflection in here is it like a p wave uh, but again it's not very clear what happens in uh, v1 uh, it's a bit dodgy here isn't it but then i would still call it as absent p waves and uh, uh, narrow qrs so by and large i mean um, for practical purposes this would be svt the avrt avnrt type you know the av reentrant and the wpw one of those and what would be your line of management it would be your adenosine and then if the patient is unstable it would be shock isn't it so what what is this actually then um, this is not a svt uh, this is not a avrt or a avnrt but this is in fact atrial flutter with two to one block it's, it's quite hard isn't it it's quite hard you can't see p waves at all but then in in p1 if you see you might get some clue as to if this is like a saw pattern isn't it saw tooth pattern so maybe this is a atrial flutter how do you manage such case for all practical purposes don't think of this as a flutter think of this as svt avrt avnrt use adenosine and then see what happens okay so this is an example where uh, this was the ecg uh, i mean here it's a bit clear but then imagine it was a previous ecg and then you have used adenosine it sometimes unmarked your flutter waves because what happens by giving adenosine you are blocking the av node further isn't it the av delay is enhanced so uh, uh, earlier it was uh, earlier every two is to one impulses were being conducted but now by giving adenosine av node is blocked further so then the qr is the, the the impulses are not traveling through the down to ventricle so your rr you know the ventricle rate is slowed but then this this point you can actually see the p waves okay the p waves are firing and then only few of them are conducted so this can actually unmask your atrial flutter okay so even in this case like don't panic your that that that's why it's important to follow the algorithm okay go step by step follow the algorithm and you might not always be correct but then that's fine i mean eventually if you follow the algorithm and if you follow the treatment pathway you will arrive at a diagnosis so this is the two is to one block atrial flutter which can look like it okay so now i am um, what do we have here <clears throat> this is not very classic of uh, saw tooth pattern isoelectric baseline is just dangling it's not a nice straight line so this is an example of atrial fibrillation uh and then it's again irregular is it it's a narrow complex because your ventricles are uh, conduction is i mean contraction is still occurring okay 
the narrow narrow complex itself indicates that your origin is somewhere above level you know above the ventricular level so and then it's very irregular so it has to be i mean and then your you can't really see very clear t waves isn't it so this is atrial fibrillation what is fibrillation your individual muscle fibers of the atria are acting like bosses or acting like smos and they are trying to give impulse okay so effective atrial contraction is not happening individual fibers are just fibrillating and that is atrial fibrillation Okay, so that's what it is: disorganized electrical activity and contraction. You have a very irregular rhythm. You can't see two waves at all, and then you will see. Yeah, no, there's no isoelectric baseline, and again, fibrillary waves can be fine or low. Um, yeah, that's where we are. And then, well, let us look at junctional echo beat. So, junctional echo beat tachycardia is by and large like most commonly seen post heart post surgery. Um, if any one of you is working in cardiac ICU, uh, this is the commonest uh, commonest um, arrhythmia which you will see in your post op visit. I'll not go into much details here, but then again, this is a supraventricular only because the vent or uh, ventric because the origin is above the ventricle level, isn't it? Yeah. So this is again your narrow complex tachycardia. What happens? The uh, Firing occurs at the junctional level, at the AV level, somewhere close to the atrioventricular node. Okay, so and then the rest of and then the impulses are traversing down. So if the rest of your uh, uh, ventricular contraction is normal, so your QRS is normal. And then what happens? It can retrogradely traverse, cause the atrial contraction. So sometimes your you can see the P waves after the QRS complex, or sometimes you may not see P waves at all. Okay, so this happens most common in post-op conditions. But then um, the SVT, what we were looking, you know, all this time absent T wave and then the QRS, so that is an abrupt onset offset. But then here we have a warm, warm up and a cool down phase that's very classic, associated with hyperthermia, associated with electrolytes, strongly associated with electrolyte imbalances, and then with uh, inotropies. Commonly in post-op cardiacs, we use adrenaline, etc., milrinone and all. But yeah, of course, adrenaline is quite notorious in, like you know, this. Dead and also um, that that's it. I mean, if you're working in cardiac, then this is one rhythm which you have to worry the most. But if you're non-cardiac setting, non non-post-op setting, then maybe you might not worry about this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let us quickly go to this. So you see, if it is narrow, QRS uh, is narrow, or if it is wide, and then if it is uh, this is the pathway for narrow. So if it is regular tachycardia or not. Uh, if it is irregular, then you have very few, isn't it? You have fibrillation, you have flutter, and then you have multifocal atrial tachycardia. Very simple. But if it is regular tachycardia, then you will see whether the P wave is visible or not. And if the P waves are visible, then you will see whether the atrial rate is more than ventricular rate, or if it is same as ventricular rate. If atrial rate is more than ventricular rate, then you know that it's either atrial flutter or atrial tachycardia. Okay. And then if it is same as ventricle, so if it's one is to one conduction, then you will look at um, your RP interval. And I mean, if you don't want to look at, uh, I mean, if, if you want to exclude all of this, then if it's equal conduction, then the common differentials could be your uh, classic, uh, you know, AV NRT, your nodal reentrant tachycardia, or AV reentrant like full, like full Parkinson white, or your atrial tachycardia. So more most often, this will lead to your uh, uh, SVT, the classic SVT, what we call as this AVRT. Uh, okay, so that was, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Nathan, uh, uh, nearly 10.30, yeah, yeah, do I have 15 moments? Is over. How, much, how, much, how many slides are left? Uh, this, this should uh, go quite quickly, I think. I mean, I don't think it should take long time. Maybe 10 minutes, That's if you give me that order. Right? Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Um, so let's look at ventricular tachycardias. This is these, these are quite straightforward and quite simple. Okay, the origin, the name itself signifies implies that the origin of tachycardia is somewhere in the ventricle. Okay, so now most by default, by and large, ventricular tachycardias, wide complex some tachycardias are ventricular tachycardias. Of course, that 10% bit of exception is there, which you need to keep in the back of your mind. But then ventricular tachycardia is wide complex. 
so again i said i am always talking about pulse okay because we are all and we are going to buy the pulse is it because we can have pulse with bt as well so this is an example of bt with pulse where the qrs complex is white and uh, again in bt you have monomorphic and polymorphic so what happens in monomorphic all the when the morphology of your qrs complex is similar whatever it is either this or this or this but then they are similar isn't it they look same throughout and then there is uh, you can't see any uh, p waves all you can see is white complex uh, uh, white qrs complexes sometimes you can see different morphologies of the qrs complexes um so that is called as polymorphic sometimes or if sometimes you can see as you, you can see the switching down the axis or like a party ribbon in like a party tree so that is tortuous key point okay it's important to differentiate between monomorphic and polymorphic because monomorphic tachycardias are usually reentrenched uh, uh, and because of enhanced automaticity but polymorphic tachycardias the origin or the mechanism the means because of prolonged qt so if polymorphic is occurring if you see polymorphic then always try to look for underlying ask for family history of sudden death and cardiomyopathy or all those fancy brugada syndrome and all you know for long qt symptoms or electrolyte disturbances you know which can sometimes prolong your qt and all so polymorphic the mechanism is different it is not like monomorphic not like automatic qt or reentrant polymorphic is because of the yeah, most of them there is a widened qt element in there i think that's uh, important uh, and then uh, how do you treat um, identify uh, and treat the cause of tachy tachyarrhythmia so the common abc remain the same you'll attach ecg ecg lead start some oxygen blood pressure iv io axis well lead ecg connect to a defib that remains the same now you will assess your qrs if it's wide or if it is narrow wide qrs is more than 0.09 seconds if it is wide then you will look at the rhythm okay so if it is sinus tachycardia we, we know the features of sinus tachycardia so no i said isn't it no qr the normal uh, narrow complex uh, is either is by default most of the supraventricular tachycardia so there are many things in supraventricular commonest is sinus tachycardia most common is this is it it's just simple things like fever and all sinus tachycardia typically the heart rate is important 220 and 180 and then svt is more than 220 for infants more than 180 for children and then the difference is no p wave p waves present in sinus but p waves are absent in the classic svt and no beat to beat variability okay so sinus you will treat the cause if it is svt you will go for vagal maneuver and then otherwise you will go for adenosine you will give one dose and then you will give double dose and then see what happens uh, sometimes um, if it is av nrt then it is abruptly treated if it is av rt you know that there's a accessory pathway kind of activity then it might help in unmasking or uh, it might not always treat or even if it treats then it can recur if it is flutter then sometimes it can unmask so whatever it is the pathway remains the same if it is white complex then again you will determine the rhythm uh, uh so again in by in by complex it is by and large ventricular uh, uh, you have to treat with the protocol if it is stable then with amiodarone procainamide and uh, cardioversion electrical cardioversion sometimes adenosine here okay um, and if it is uh, we know that 10% of svt is can And have white QRS is it? So that that bit comes here, okay. Uh, but even even if you are strongly suspecting SVT here, even if it is actually a supraventricular tachycardia with a white complex, uh, it makes sense to treat it like a VT only rather than as SVT. You have to follow the pathway, pulse pathway, and you have to treat it as VT only for all practical purposes with the uh, with the with the amiodarone and procainamide and electrical cardioversion. and uh, this is uh, again um, the same identify and uh, treat the cause of uh, this is the one uh, the, the earlier this flow chart was where you know the pulse was stable uh, uh, you know like with a stable uh, and not not in not not short or not with a hemodynamic compromise but here this algorithm shows uh, when there is hemodynamic compromise then what do you do your abc and all remain the same but then if it is bt here if it is a wide qrs complex and if it is bt 
then uh, unstable, then you will directly go for uh, uh, cardio version. <clears throat> okay. Uh, rather than, I mean, you'll try, directly try and use the refit machine rather than using all your uh, uh, drugs. And then here as well, like if it is SPT, uh, here again, I mean, uh, you will not delay for adenosine and all, but you will straight away if the patient is not, uh, uh, is, is not, uh, I mean, is hemodynamically compromised, you will go straight ahead for synchronized cardio version uh, rather than your other things. I mean, you, you can still, while things are being prepared for these, uh, for your adhesive machine to be attached, and you, know, you can still try vehicle manovers and uh, adenosine, but you should not delay unnecessarily. You, know? you should try and um, shock the patient. ST, rarely, you know, it can be uh, uh, hemodynamically compromised. I mean, usually this is. And then never forget your hedges and feet. So coming to slow rhythms, we have from slow rhythms, you can um, uh, differentiate, you, you can divide as primary and secondary. Primary are mainly because of etiology in the cardiac, there's some cardiac problem, like myocarditis, cardiomyopathy, heart block, etc. But secondary, it's because of secondary, other than cardiac, like hypoxia, acidosis, hypotension, etc. And again, slow rhythms, uh, the problem can lie somewhere in either it can be sinus bradycardia, which can be very physiological medications, etc. But otherwise, again, it can be because of problem in your SA node or problem in your AV node. This is again very simple. SA node example is sick sinus syndrome, where your SA node is working, but it's not working properly. It causes tachycardia, it causes bradycardia sometimes. You know, it's, it's not working properly. And then there is, uh, whenever there is exertion, it fails to increase the heart rate appropriately. So that is sick sinus syndrome. And then we have AV nodal block, which is first degree, second degree, and third degree, which we will um, go through. So these are again um, AV blocks. I'm not going into very detail ECG or sinus, bradycardia, and all because it's quite simple. Uh, everything is the same except that your heart rate is a bit slower. Slower compared to the age uh, limit. And then your AV block, uh, first degree is where your PR interval is prolonged. Okay, so normally it's between 120 to 200 or 0.1 to 2.20, but then here it is prolonged, isn't it? So that is your first degree AV block. Um, yeah. So what is this rhythm? Um, here again, you have to go through your P wave QRS. So here the PR interval is a bit short, slow, smaller, and here it's a bit uh, wider. So what's happened here? Here there is no QRS, isn't it? After this, uh, after after this thing, there is uh, no QRS again, like it's a missed beat. And then again, the story repeats, a small PR. So the, here there is again, uh, the PR interval starts prolonging until there is a missed beat. So that is your second degree heart block or Mobis type one. So uh, this is an example. This is, a, this is another example of Mobis type one, where this is your PR interval here. Then it's a bit prolonged, then it's further prolonged, it's further prolonged, and then here there is a missed beat. Okay, so that is known as Mobitz type 1. And here this is uh, Mobitz type 2, where um, there is a P wave, but then there is no, um, no conduction or no, no QRS complex. And then there is a P wave and there is a conduction here, there is a P wave and there is no conduction. So this again happens in blocks, like there is either a, a two is to one block or a, two is, or a three is to one block. So that is known as Mobitz type two. So in type one, it prolongs and then there is one missed beat, but in Mobitz type two, there is usually a, a variable kind of block. And then this is an example of complete heart block. So uh, how normally how it's best, uh, how do you normally see a complete heart block? It's usually best to have a paper a, a, a small, a, either a scale or a strip of paper, and then you mark uh, where your P waves are, you mark it on the paper, and then you keep sliding across the ECG. Okay, so um, this, so first of all, your RR intervals, they are, um, they are occurring at regular intervals, isn't it? Now, when you come to P, then this is one here, and then this is, this is uh, another PP, and then this is another PP. So you have to keep sliding across and then you will here realize that P waves are blocking, uh, uh, P waves are firing at a different rate and the QRS complexes are firing at a different rate. 
which means it is complete cut block. And it's, it's, it's usually very easy to have that scale or a paper and then slide across. Um, yeah, again, this is another example. So this is C, this is C, this is C, this is another P, this is another P. So if you put the paper across, then you see that the PP, the PP interval is the same and then the RR interval is the same. Okay. And uh, this is the bradycardia algorithm, which is again ABC, and then uh, it's essentially heart rate less than 60, you do um, the pulse uh, PLS algorithm of chest compressions and adrenaline. And I don't think I need to go into the detail here. And then the last one is your pulseless arrest. Um, so this is, so remember we talked about two fast pulse, two slow pulse, and then what if there is no pulse? So when there is no pulse, most often, again, it's asphyxial arrest or cardiac arrest. We know that in children, asphyxial arrest is more common, whereas in adults, cardiac arrest is more common. I mean, the cardiac cause of cardiac arrest is more common, isn't it? Yeah. So that's why children have better prognosis. I mean, like they, they, they are easy to re revise when they have had a cardiac arrest because most often it is respiratory etiology. So pulseless arrest can also, we have four different types of um, rhythms here. There is a VTAC without pulse, a ventricular tachycardia without a pulse. Then we have ventricular fibrillation, pulseless electrical activity, and asystole. So we simply go through the uh, ECG rhythms, and I think that, that would be it. So this is, again, a classic VG, which we saw earlier. So that's why even when you have an ECG rhythm or defib, whatever the rhythm is showing, it's important that someone actually has a hand on the patient's pulse. Because the ECG will be the same, isn't it? It's VT, but who knows it's VT with pulse or without pulse. So it's important to have someone's hand on the pulse. You know, that you can't, I mean, there's, there's no compromise over that. So this is, so let's say there's no pulse and then this is the rhythm of VT without pulse. So what is this? This is an example of, this is the fibrillation. So all the, there is no uniform ventricular contraction as in AF, atrial fibrillation, we said. Again, in ventricular fibrillation, the ventricle as such does not contract in together. Individual ventricle muscle fibers are contracting, are fibrillating. And that's why uh, this QRS, some, uh, like you can't see a P wave, you can't see a QRS, you can't see a T wave. Some random bizarre waves are going across. That is your ventricular fibrillation. And then what is this? This is your... Asystole. It's a flat line, isn't it? Sometimes it's a flat, sometimes it can be a slight baby. And then there is no pulse. That is important. I mean, if the patient is having pulse, but then if your uh, SATS probe is disconnected, so I mean, yeah, we have to correlate and that's why rhythms are always with pulse. So there is no pulse and then you get a flat wave. That is asystole. And then what is this? Here you can see a P wave, you can see a bit of QRS, but this QRS looks wide and then this is a T wave. What is this? Is this a white QRS? Whatever, but then no. This, that's why again pulse is important. This is pulseless. Uh, the, the patient is pulseless. So this is some electrical activity is happening, but it is pulseless. So this is a PEA, pulseless electrical activity. Sometimes it may be, you know, uh, interesting to see that there can actually be all the comp components of uh, 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 ECG, you know, like a proper T wave, QRS, a nice T wave can be occurring, but then there is no pulse. So um, it should not be confused with any other rhythm. So that's, that's the PE. And the algorithm, the treatment algorithm for your asystole and PEA is the same as, you know, that's a cardiac arrest algorithm. And for a v, uh, ventricular fibrillation and the pulseless uh, VT, it's a different algorithm where you do shock. Not, I'm not going to go into the details. Of it. And I think that's it. I think it was one of the most incredible presentation <coughs> of pediatric ECGs I have heard in uh, such a long time. And uh, I have refreshed my knowledge today again. Uh, it was really great, uh, Dr. Shandi. And yeah, thank you, Dr. Shandhi. I have no words. <laughs> it, it was really good. Specifically, the portion of uh, JET and extra, extra atrial, uh, atrial tachycardia, then uh, MAT, EAT, they are too good. I think it Thank is the you. simplest way I have uh, uh, seen somebody explaining it. Um, there is one comment uh, in the chat box and there are no questions. So okay. 
uh, they are talking about Dr. Sanket Bhadra that uh, I think in the last slide when you were mentioning about uh, blocks, there is a comment that ma'am, is it two is two one block? Uh, I think Mobits two, Mobits one. Uh, the block is what the what the doctor wants to ask. Uh, in case there is another question by anyone, you can put in in the chat box. Yeah. So. Yeah, these are essentially heart blocks, isn't it? I mean the um the atrio. The, the AV node is not conducting the impulses as it is normally supposed to be, and it's causing a block at every level. So again, that's why we have this degree. And, uh, it's like essentially, you know, in Mobitz type one, one QRS is missing, isn't it? So that is Mobitz type one. So it's a block again. And then in the second, in the Mobitz, uh, uh, sorry, in the uh, Mobitz type two block, uh, then there is like. Um, uh, not all the P waves are followed by a QRS. So there is some uh, some P waves and then some QRSs are missed. So it's like a two is to one block. So yeah, I think, yeah, what you say, what you commented is right. I think uh, Dr. Sanket has got his answer. He has uh, put another comment on the group and I, I believe your answer has already answered his question as well. So mm -hmm. there is no other questions. And uh, it was a pleasure having you, Dr. Shalmi over here with the, uh, the type of knowledge you have shared, I'm I'm sure it will it will train many and it will motivate many others. Thank you for sparing your time and thanks yeah. for uh, for the session. Thank you, Doctor Nitin, actually for giving me this opportunity. And it's also like refreshing my memory. And I would like to thank all the participants for their very patient listening. I've exceeded the time, but yeah, thank you. Thank you, madam. Take care. Yeah.